Psalms 119, 97 through 112, the New Revised Version. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all day long. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it's always with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your decrees are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn away from your ordinances, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Though your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your lamp is a light unto my feet. I'm sorry, your word is a light unto my feet and a lamp into my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joys of my life. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. How do you read it? The Bible is front and center for the people of the Christian faith. Regardless of tradition, regardless of time, regardless of place. If you are a Christian, you're going to spend some amount of time studying the Bible. Across the Christian traditions, people say that the Bible is the Word of God. What does that mean? The Bible is the Word of God. And yet, across the Christian traditions, people interpret it so vastly different. Um, what does the Bible say about war? <laughs> Depends on which verses you quote and which ones you give credence to. Well, what does the Bible say about capital punishment? You had an argument like that before? Or what about baptism? What is it for and, and what's the mode? How should we baptize? You do know, I'm assuming, that more Christian traditions disagree with us than agree with us on how baptism should be practiced in the church. How, how do we figure all these things out? And yet all the Christian traditions would say the Bible is the Word of God. It's my personal opinion that if you dig deep enough into the culture wars of our day. I mean, if you really dig down through all the propaganda and all the talking heads and get into the heart of the matter, most of the time you're talking about a battle over how to interpret the Bible. Over the next few weeks, I hope to give you some food for thought about how to read the Bible, how to think about the Bible, how to do the Bible. I hope to give you tools to read it well, and lights that will help guide the way. It might feel more like teaching than preaching. I'm okay with that. I hope you are. But every Sunday we gather in this text and preach from the Bible. I thought we would be wise to take a few weeks and take a step back and preach about the Bible. I hope you'll join me and bring your hearts and minds along the way as well. Oh Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, so that we would know your will and do your will. Amen. Behind every pedagogy is, an, is a philosophical anthropology. <laughs> you woke up early this morning, I thought I'd welcome you to church with that sentence. 
I mean, why use a one-cent word when a ten-cent word will do? I, actually, I got that phrase from a Christian theologian. His name's James Smith. He recently published a book called Desiring the Kingdom. And he says, behind every pedagogy is a philosophical anthropology. In other words, behind every theory of education, behind every theory of how to teach well, is a theory of what it means to be human. Our convictions about teaching spread about people. Before we can teach a person, we have to think deeply about what it means to be a person. In that same book, Smith declares that the Enlightenment and the three to four centuries that have followed have reduced our view of humanity and therefore somewhat distorted our views of education. Rene Descartes, in kicking off the Enlightenment, we like to say, said, I think, therefore I am, which became sort of the mantra for the Enlightenment. What makes us human is rational thought. It's, it's rational thought that separates us from the lower animals. So what it means to be human is to think. And so, because we think of humans as primarily thinking creatures, education becomes helping people think. Education is about information, ideas, reasoning, problem solving. There's no need for community for this to happen. You don't have to act on the information. You just have to comprehend it and be able to fill in the bubble by the right answer. To this day, we have a very heady view of education. And if you listen to people talk about education, they're likely to talk about science and technology and math which are all disciplines based on rational thought and reason. Behind every pedagogy is a philosophical anthropology. But the truth is, we humans aren't just thinking creatures. We're also desiring creatures. Thinking is one thing we do amongst many. And the brain is one part of our body amongst many. We don't just think our way through life, we feel our way through life. We urge our way through life. We didn't just walk into this room today thinking thoughts. We all walked into this room today feeling things, bearing burdens and celebrating joys. We walked into this room desiring things. And oftentimes, it's these more fundamental levels of our humanity that drive our rational thinking. As Blaise Pascal once said, the heart has reasons that reason knows not of. I remember the first time I ever saw the movie Jaws. You remember that movie? I was a young child at my grandma's house. And before you begin questioning her character for letting me watch that movie as a young child, you should know that scaring each other to death is a form of affection in my family. And so, I was lying in her living room watching Jaws, and the music started. Da -na. I mean, you know, TJ knows. It's coming. And the, the pace quickens, and there's an innocent teenager flopping around in the water, having the time of her life. Da -na and it's getting faster, and the camera's panning in, the camera's zooming in, when all of a sudden my grandma took a pillow off the couch and threw it and hit me in the leg and said, Ah! <laughs> now, as a young child, I knew that movie was not real. I knew. And today, I know I'm 101% certain that movie is not real. I've seen the fake Jaws. It's not real. I know. But when I hear the music, my pulse quickens and my pupils dilate. And when I'm swimming in the ocean, if anything so much as seaweed touches my foot, it might as well be Jaws. I know the statistics and I know the data. You can spend all the time you want to describing to me the scarcity of shark attacks. 
I get it. I know it. But, brothers and sisters, it wasn't data that got me into that mess. And it's not data that's going to get me out. You, you can't think your way out of a problem you've lived your way into. You can't think your way out of a problem you felt your way into. It's like that song that was sung at your dad's funeral. And whenever you hear it, wherever you are, boom, you are transported into that pew, into that very seat. You can hear it. You can feel some of what you felt that day. And you don't even have to think about it. It's controlling you. You're not controlling it. Or like when you smell banana bread. And whew, you're back at your grandma's house where she made the best banana bread. Or it's what happens when you give careful thought to the reality that it's absolutely essential for a newborn baby to have skin-to-skin -skin contact with other human beings. There is a neurological difference in what happens with babies who have skin-to-skin -skin contact and those who don't. The body and the brain are somehow linked. There's a mysterious synergy there. To be human, y'all, is not just to think. It's also to feel and desire and to love. The body is involved. If so, then our education must reach those deeper levels of our being. To truly teach someone, you don't just teach them a subject. You teach them to love that subject. You don't just teach for information, you teach for transformation. Good teaching doesn't just download data into someone's brain, but it creates a certain posture of the heart that opens them up to newness and growth. The best education reaches our full humanity, our pre-critical lives. The stories and the images, the values that lie deeper than our ability to articulate them. In short, we're not what we think. We're what we love, what we desire, what we delight in. What was it Jesus said? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He didn't say where your worldview is, there your heart will be also. He didn't say where your ideas are. He said where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If humans are creatures of love, then what does it mean to really teach people? Today, if you say to someone, come to Bible study with me, you're apt to get a grunt and a rolling of the eyes. You might as well say, hey, come mow my yard with me. Bible study doesn't exactly captivate the soul today or arouse anyone's imagination. And there's a part of me that totally understands it. We see so many egregious abuses of Scripture that it makes us not want to use it anymore at all. When you hear that the devil quotes Scripture too, it makes you wonder if it's really God you're hearing in Bible study. By the time you've been beaten over the head with the Bible, you're afraid to open it. I understand that. But none of us stop using a tool simply because other people misuse it. Also, sometimes we don't want to go to Bible study because people flatten out the Scriptures in the way they study it. With the best of intentions. Some people go to the Bible as if it's a troubleshooting manual. You understand what I'm saying? What does the Bible say about... Now, now hear me. I'm a preacher. And wherever I see people reading the Bible, I'm pretty happy about that. Let me say that from the beginning. But if that's the only way we read Scripture, what does the Bible say about? Then we turn the Bible into a sort of special interest manual, and our interests aren't always special. Have you noticed that some of the things that captivate us, some of the things that we spend thousands of hours thinking about, the Bible seems unconcerned about altogether? What do we do with that? Some people study the Bible, a verse here, a verse there, and it's cut off from the larger story altogether. It's sort of like an assembly manual. Nobody reads an assembly manual. 
They read a part of the assembly. We don't read it cover to cover, French and all. We, we read the part of the assembly manual that we're having trouble with. And then when we're done with that specific part, we put it away, throw it away. It's of no use anymore. Sometimes we read the Bible that way. But your life and my life is quite different than repairing a washing machine. It doesn't work the same way. And let's be honest, sometimes we don't want to study the Bible or read the Bible because it's so stinking boring. The Bible is interesting, I once heard a professor say. It takes a preacher to make it boring. <laughs> Sometimes we read the Bible as if we're reading a tax code. No wonder, given all these reasons, people don't want to study the Scriptures these days. I get that. People don't want to read the Bible for the same reason people don't read anything in our culture. But there are different kinds of books which demand different kinds of reading. We can faithfully read an instruction manual of some sort and put it away and not be transformed by it at all. It didn't touch our lives at all. It just told us how to turn the screw. That's it. We can skip around the newspaper, reading the articles about which we care and skipping the ones we don't. And when we put the paper down, we know a tad bit more about the world, but nothing more about ourselves. We're unchanged. But then there's the lady at the airport. Have you seen her? The whole time you were in the waiting area with her, flight delayed, she had her head buried in a 700-page novel. You've seen her, haven't you? She read and read and read, and the world was passing her by, and she did not care one iota. And then she finished the book and shut it, and leaned back in her chair and closed her eyes while tears streamed down her face. Different kinds of books demand different kinds of reading. Did you notice what the psalmist says about the law here? Rebecca read from Psalm 119 this morning. It's the longest chapter in our Bible, 176 verses. It's actually an acrostic poem. If you want to learn the Hebrew alphabet, and I'm certain you do, you can read through Psalm 119 and see that there are headings that are letters of the Hebrew alphabet. In Hebrew, every line under that letter begins with that letter. It's a fascinating literary masterpiece. Quite a long song if you sing it, I would imagine. We read today under the sections Mam and Noon, or we would say M and N. You're, you're in the heart of the alphabet and therefore in the heart of the psalm here. And did you hear what the psalmist said? How I love your law. Not just how I think about it, not just how I study it, but how I love your law. And the writer writes about how she studies the law because she loves it. She meditates on it day and night because she loves it. How sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey in my mouth. There is a delight in the taste buds. When I was in seminary, this book fell into my hands. I, I cannot, for the life of me, remember how. It is an autographed copy of the, of the biography of George W. Truett, who was one of the most famous Baptist preachers of all time, internationally known in the early 20th century. They said his funeral line uh, was the longest that Dallas has ever seen, an incredible figure. This is autographed, by the way. I began reading through it in my spare time in seminary <laughs> and uh, kept it on the end table in the living room. And one day I came home and Roxy, our Yorkshire Terrier, whom I had loved deeply until that day, I fed her and watered her and cleaned up after her. I loved her. She had drugged this book off the table, and can you see that? She began gnawing on the corner of that book. Nearly tore it apart. It's gross. I don't even like to pick the book up now. 
And I had my Greek New Testament. If you come to my office, my Greek New Testament. Anytime I brought a book home, she chewed it. And I was angry at her until I really began to think about the way I experience books and the way she experiences books. It's possible, you know, to read something and it remains entirely external to you. It's also possible to read something so that it's digested and it becomes part of who you are. Some people read books. Other people chew them, swallow them. The psalmist said, your law is sweet to the tongue, like sweet honey. And this is where we must bring to mind at the beginning of this series what the Bible is and what the Bible is not. A technical book requires technical reading, but you don't taste it. A brain is all you need with a technical book. Turn, screw 1A. Boom. Turn, screw 1A. A novel or a poem or a story of any sort, poem like Psalm 119, has to be inhabited, internalized, tasted. And this is not our default orientation as a culture. We're not good at this, brothers and sisters. When we read something like an instruction manual, there's an immediate payoff. Boom! Fixed! Boom! Built! Boom! Constructed! I did it! But life is not a technical enterprise. When we read informative essays, boom! We know something more about something. But reading a poem of which Scripture is saturated has no practical usefulness. You, you don't put a poem down and say, well, now I can go whatever. You sit there and you think. And you visit your soul. And you think about the way that poet saw the world. One who writes from the soul can only be read by one who reads from the soul. You don't apply a poem to your life. You have to apply your life to the poem. And all of your life, not just your brain. You have to bring your brains, yes. But also your heart and your soul, your experiences and your dreams, your fears and your hopes, your pains, your pre-critical subconscious self. Spiritual writing demands spiritual reading. And this means there is likely to be no immediate payoff, but a stirring of the depths. It won't give you three steps to anything but it'll give you a way of ordering your steps. Reading the Bible, if you do it well, might make you cry. It might make you laugh. It might cause that primordial shiver in your spine that we've yet to fully explain. It might also challenge primal assumptions you have about God and the world and yourself. Over the course of time, we've done a number of things to the Bible. We've argued about it, we've dissected it, we've debated it, we've thumped it. We've taught it in ways that caused boredom, and we've preached it in ways that caused snortum. But it seems to me that the one thing we have totally forgotten to do with the Bible is enjoy it. We've forgotten to delight in it. We've forgotten to taste the sweet honey. And we are a far cry from the psalmist who said, Your words are as honey on my tongue. I love your law. Y'all, our relationship with God is a lot like every other relationship we have in our lives. It's largely consistent upon listening. We genuinely listen to people we love. We listen to what they say. And we listen to what they don't say. We deeply listen to people we love. In the monastic traditions of the Christian faith, they say this is true with God as well. And it's true with the Word of God. In the monastic traditions, they practice a way of reading the Bible called Lectio Divina, which is translated divine reading. And they said there was a great difference between reading the Bible and listening to it. Actually, if you pressed them, they would say, it's not the Bible as a book you're listening to. It's the whisper of God in the Bible that you're listening to. Reading the Scriptures for them was not just an exercise in cognition, but an exercise of the heart 
It wasn't so much a form of study as it was a form of prayer. And it didn't so much arise from a desire to learn as it did a desire to love. Love and listening go together in our Bible study in the same way love and listening go together everywhere else in the world. So, as you know, I'm trying to raise small humans. And they have friends, which mean I'm often hanging around with small humans. I'm coaching a fourth grade basketball team. To this day, I don't know how I got into that, but I am. I'm coaching a fourth grade basketball team. I have this bad habit around children. You might as well. I don't know why I do this. I just do it. Whenever I see a child doing something I shouldn't, I ask, why are you doing that? Don't ask that question. When you ask a child, why did you do that? What will the child say? I don't know. And they don't. These people, they don't. They don't know. Some people say it's because their brains aren't developed. They don't think and act. They act and then think and it's part of normal formation and that kind of stuff. And that's true. But the more I'm around older children, like the rest of us, the more I wonder if we ever really grow out of that. Why did you say that? She says to her husband. Why did you say that? Well, I don't know. Why do you think that way? Well, it's because... I don't know. Why are you angry? I'm not angry, just get out of my way. Why are you angry? I don't know. I had not had coffee, I'm angry. Why are you crying? I'm not crying, you're crying. No, why are you crying? I don't know. And the truth is, you don't either. When you go to a museum and stand before a work of art and cry, when some, were, were some lower mortal to come up to you and say, why are you crying? You would say, I, I don't know. Or at a play. When you have seen something you've always seen, but you've never really seen it, but now you see it. Why are you crying? Do you remember the story of the sheep and the goats? Before the great throne of God on that grand day, Jesus separates the nations. Hey, hey, you sheep, you get over here. Because when I was hungry, you fed me, and thirsty, you gave me drink, and homeless, you housed me, and sick, you cared for me, in prison, you visited me. And, and you goats, you, you over here, because you didn't do those things. Do you remember how the sheep and the goats respond? Neither group understands. I find that staggering. The sheep say, what? When did we see you? We didn't know. We, we didn't know that was you. And the goats say, when did we not see you? Were you to ask either group, why they did what they did or didn't do what they didn't do. Were you to ask either group, they would have said, I don't know. They didn't do it because they thought about it. They did it because they acted out of who they were. It was a reflex that had been shaped over time. Maybe even, dare I say, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. They were just acting out of the habits that grew from their instincts. The faith of both of those groups was pre-critical and subconscious and super rational. I'll tidy it up today with this. One of the oldest Christian liturgies is called the Sursum Cordum. In Latin it translates, we lift up our hearts. And so the priest at the beginning of the Eucharist stands behind the pulpit and he says, we lift up our hearts and the congregation responds, we lift them up to the Lord. Can we do that this morning, the Sursum Quartum? We lift up our hearts. Good. 
sounded kind of Baptist. We can work on that. But <laughs> I think what I'm trying to say today is what they're trying to pray every day. I think. I think that they're praying that their worship is a lifting up to God of those places that lie deeper than words, where the darkest shadows and the most profound joys dance together, where our deepest longings reside before we can articulate them, and our deepest inclinations live before our brain has systematized them. We lift up to that to God because we want God to have our full humanity. We aren't just thinkers. So perhaps, before we pick up our Bibles, we could pray that prayer. We lift our hearts up to the Lord. Y'all, I hope that Bible study in this church, whether it's in Sunday school or teaching on Wednesday night, or maybe even a sermon on Sunday morning, I hope it challenges your brain. I do. I hope you leave thinking and reflecting and pondering and loving God with the best of the brains God gave you. I hope so. But I also hope that as we're teaching you how to learn the Scriptures, we're also teaching you how to love the Scriptures. And I guess what I'm really trying to say is that we should read the good book as if it's a good book. So, how do we read it? We'll get there. But first of all, we lift our hearts up to the Lord. Oh Lord, we walked into this place today with things we know and things we believe, things about which we're uncertain, and things that we want to believe and need to believe. We also walked in here today with a lot of baggage in the depths of our souls. And a lot of grace in there too. We lift all that up to you, O oh Lord, in the hopes that you can sort it out and pack it back in and remove the things that don't belong. We lift it up to you today in the hopes that you will shape the deepest parts of who we are so that our gut is connected with your gut our heart is connected with your heart our brain is connected with your brain our tongue is connected with your tongue our feet and our hands our eyes and our ears so that all of who we are is connected with all of who you are, O oh Lord. That is why we worship today. And that's why we open the Bible every time we do so. To that end, help us, O oh God. We lift our hearts up to the Lord. Amen.